Amen. Yeah, I like that. Pearson thinks I'm going to forget what God has told me, so he just prayed for me. Somehow, let Steve remember what you've told him all week, so I'm going to try, okay? I, st- I, started, uh, I started studying this week in the book of Chronicles and praying over uh, some scriptures in Chronicles, and then now don't turn to Chronicles. You may have a hard time finding it. The same story that I'm going to focus on today is also in 2 Samuel. So if you want to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23, we're going to be studying there. And the reason I switched to Samuel is because I'm going to reference Samuel and some other places anyway, so it makes it easier for us to flip back and forth. Now, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to start in verse 8 of chapter 23, and it tells some information about some of David's mighty men or mighty warriors. And I found this really strikingly interesting, what we find here. And so, and I got to thinking, why are these warriors mighty? What makes them mighty? In all, there's 37 mighty warriors listed. And the front three we're going to focus on more. They're the leaders of basically the 37. And the first one is captains of captains. And so he's probably David's really his right-hand man at this point in time. So we'll start off in verse 8 and look at the first one. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshua Besabatha. Man, I even practiced that. And I, all right, I'm going to get it right because I really did practice that name. Josabasabeth, thank you, a Tachemonite. Chief of the captains, he was called Adino the Esnite, the Esnite because of 800 slain by him at one time. So now he is captain of captains. He has a very long name, and he's one of the men that David really trusts. And this man really trusts David. And he was responsible for slaying 800 at one time. And these men, remember, they were given the task of establishing the nation of Israel. Since the crossing of the Jordan before, when Joshua took a cross, God commanded them to establish the nation of Israel because through the nation of Israel, the world was supposed to be reached, proselyted. And also through the nation of Israel would come the righteous branch. The Lord Jesus Christ would come through this. It was also important to establish David's throne and make it secure because that was a picture of the coming kingdom when Jesus Christ sits on the throne of David, which we have not yet experienced. That'll happen during the millennial kingdom. So this first one, and I'm just going to call him Josh because even though I practiced his name, I messed it up. This Josh, he was a chief of captains and 800 men were slain by him at one time. You know, I think about these men and I look at this and for that to happen, they had to be incredibly gifted. You know, that's virtually impossible to, for 800, for one man to take on 800. But they were incredibly gifted and they were blessed of the Lord to carry out what God had asked them to do. Then in verse 9, and after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there to battle, and the men of Israel had withdrawn. And so here you have David and these three other men, and they're going to engage the Philistines in battle, and the army retreats, but they don't. He arose and struck the Philistines until his, until his hand was weary and clung to the sword, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to strip the slain. So then all these soldier, soldier, soldiers come back to see what they can find in their pockets, right? So now I, I was thinking about this, and what, they, what makes these men so mighty? Well, obviously, they're gifted of the Lord to carry about the Lord's work that he had given them to establish this kingdom, but also, they're incredibly brave. You know, in order to go do things like this, I'm telling you, if everybody, if every one of us in this room, except for me, starts running out the door, I'm going to have a hard time not running. I don't even know what you're running from. I've seen herds of cattle do that. One of them will take off running. They all think, oh, I better run. So they all run. They don't even know what they're running from. But here they are, and they're, they're about to engage the Philistines, right? And the whole army retreats, but these three and David. That's incredible bravery. And guys, I'm telling you, living in the fallen world as we do, bravery is important. We have to be brave. You have to be brave to raise kids. You have to be brave to do all the things that you do. You have to be brave to be an example, to witness to others. Do not let fear be your master. If fear is your master, 
then you'll have it very difficult leading a life of faith. They are opposed. Now, fear is important. You know, I have fear of putting my finger in a light socket, which is a good thing, right? And so fear is important. He's given it to us, but fear is also a tool, and it is not to be our master. These mighty men were very brave to carry out the will of God. Now, the third one after him was Shammah, the son of Ag, a Herorite, and the Philistines were gathered into a troop where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. So again, the army fled. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot, defended it, and struck the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. So I was thinking about these men, and another, another thing that I think is very important is their loyalty and their faithfulness to the cause that they're called to do. When everybody ran, he stayed and took a stand. He was faithful to David. He was faithful to his nation for carrying out the will of God and establishing it as a nation. So I think that's the three most important attributes of these men. They were gifted. I believe they were anointed to carry out the will of God to establish this nation. They did amazing things, and the Lord carried out great victories. But they were also incredibly brave. Fear was not their master. They overcame fear to accomplish God's will. And last, they were faithful. They were faithful to God, and they were faithful to their king, and they stood their ground. Look at this next story. What happens next? Okay, Verse 13, these three, then three of the 30 chief men went down and came to David in the harvest time to the cave of Adullam, while the troop of the Philistines was camping in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, while the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. So the Philistines had invaded the promised land. They had occupied even as far as Bethlehem. And look at, David just says something. David had a craving and said, oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem which is by the gate. Now, I do not believe David intended for anyth- anybody to do anything about this. He probably thought nobody was crazy enough to do anything about this because who is occupying Bethlehem? The Philistines are. Well, guess what these men do? So David just has a craving. You know, you ever have a craving for something? Man, I wish I could have a... Dr. Pepper? Okay, I was thinking something fried. Man, <laughs> That's good, that's good. But David had a craving. Oh, that someone would give me a Dr. Pepper to drink. And then, you know, and the Dr. Pepper plant is behind the enemy lines, right? You can't get to it. So look at verse 16. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. They risked their lives because he had a craving. You talk about loyalty and faithfulness. They risked their lives just because their king had a craving. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. So I wonder what their minds were. They went, risked their lives, they'll go get this water. And David, the first thing he does is pours it out on the ground. But look at his explanation. And he said, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. You see, see, that's the interesting thing about it is that these men that were his right-hand men were like David. You can go back and see the bravery and the confidence and faith in God that David had to accomplish incredible things that were impossible. Even the, the slaying of Goliath when he was very young with a stone. Incredible bravery, incredible faith. They were gifted warriors in the name of the Lord. So now I've started looking down some of these other names, and it lists all the others. Basically, the other 34 mighty men, it lists, and it kind of goes down. And working my way down, all the way down, I worked my way down. I didn't recognize any names till I got to verse 39. There's Uriah the Hittite. You know who that is, right? That's Bathsheba's husband that David had killed. And so what struck me when I was studying this this week is how did David get from there to there? How does a man like David get there? 
It's, it's almost baffling. A man after God's own heart. One thing it does tell me, and I want to warn each and every one of you, is that it can happen to anybody. If you would have asked David, back when this other stuff was going on, if you were to tell him, David, you're going to have Uriah the Hittite murdered, you're going to commit adultery with his wife, he would have laughed. I'm certain of it. No way is that going to happen. If it can happen to David, it can happen to any of us. And so I'm telling you, beware. Beware. Now, what brought this about? It didn't just happen overnight. It doesn't, the scriptures do not say a lot about it. I don't think it was a particularly fast thing. I think it was kind of a, a fade or, or like a slow fade in that one song that I like by the Casting Crowns. Now, turn with me now to 2 Samuel chapter 11. We'll look at basically the verses that begin when David commits his sin with Bathsheba. We're not going to look at the whole story for time's sake. Amen. Then it happened in the spring at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David stayed at Jerusalem. So now David was, he was a great warrior, and he was given the command to, to go and to fight and to clear the land and establish his throne, and he's always been out there with his troops fighting side by side with them, even when everybody else ran. But now David is where? He's at home. He didn't go. Now the question is why? You know, was he physically able? Well, I'll show you some verses in a little bit where he went back after this. After he repented, he went back, and he was back with the troops on the field. But how did this come about, you know? And then, of course, he's idle here, and he's his, his troops were out there. He's supposed to be out there. And then when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. He was bored. He had nothing to do. And the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And you know the rest of the story. But how did he, how did he get here? And, you know, I think if you, if you look at some other examples in the Bible, you can see the pattern that takes place. And let's go to his son, and I'm not going to turn to Scripture. Let's go to Solomon. He achieved great success. And it sounds like through the book of Ecclesiastes that he became complacent, perhaps even bored or frustrated with what is the point of it all. And then he sinned, and that split the kingdom. You know, I think the same kind of thing happened with David, and I'm warning, this is a warning to us. Guys, beware of complacency. We live in the Laodicean church age, which the church is characterized during this time period as being lukewarm or complacent. David was anything but lukewarm in his early years, and again in his later years. But it snuck in and got him, and the consequences were serious. His and Bathsheba's first baby died because of it. He murdered one of his best friends, and he had to live with that. Can you imagine David, when they get to Abraham's bosom, they're already there, but when David sees Uriah the Hittite for the first time, can you imagine what that's like? Then, as a result of it too, one of his sons, Absalom, as a result of this, rebels against him. Now, it doesn't say it's a direct result, but God says you'll have strife in your kingdom and in your own family as a result of this sin that you have done. Well, Absalom rebelled, sought after David, basically took the throne and tried to kill him, and then Absalom died in battle, and David mourned his death. I think he mourned the death of his son, but he also mourned because he knew that he had caused it all. Now, looking at that, if you were to ask David today, and we don't, I'm certain we can say so because Psalm 51, he repented of it all and you can read his words, but if you were to ask him, well, David, was it worth it? Maybe it seemed like it at the time because he was at a complacent, vulnerable spot. Most certainly he would say it was not worth it. 
And guys, I want to tell you, this is a warning. It never is. It's not worth it. Stay faithful to the Lord. Stay faithful to God. Now turn to 2 Samuel. David ends up, after he repents, and that's, like I said, that's recorded in Psalm 51, one of his psalms that he wrote. And then in verse 15 of chapter 21, David is back on the field again. Now when the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David went down and his servants with him. And as they fought against the Philistines, David became weary. Well, he could have just been tired, but no, this is toward the end of his life. I think he was getting old. Then Ishbi Benob, who was among the descendants of the giant, the weight of whose spear was 300 shekels of bronze in weight. So this is one of Goliath's descendants was girded with a new sword, and he intended to kill David. And he probably would have. Verse 17, but Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, helped him and struck the Philistine and killed him. Now look at what the men tell David next. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, you shall not go out again with us to battle, so that you do not extinguish the lamp of Israel. So now David has gotten older, and he's vulnerable. He's not a mighty warrior anymore. And his men are telling him, now, now you can stay home. Isn't that interesting? But the point of this scripture is, guys, I want to tell you, the point of this scripture is, look, I don't know where you've been, what you've messed up, but we can repent, even of complacency. There's a turnaround. Psalm 51, David repents, and he goes back to doing what God has told him to do. Now, I used to give youth advice whenever they would mess up and I said well you can you can continue and and use the logic that Satan probably puts in your head well I've already messed up I might as well go all the way or what's the point now I messed up no get up dust yourself off turn around and go in the right direction now if you don't know what I'm talking well maybe it's just maybe it's complacency then it is very hard to not become complacent. You know, I'll take a cold bottle of water with me out to the shop, and how long does it take when it's 99 for it to warm up? Or if it's minus two outside like last winter, how long would it take for it to cool down and freeze? It's hard to stay. Don't become complacent. Don't become complacent. It matters. It makes a difference. Now I want to just read you some of David's last words in 2 Samuel chapter 23. I'm not going to read all of this. This was probably a psalm. It was a psalm. Now these are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, declares, the man who was raised on high declares the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. The spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men righteously, who rules in the fear of God. Now this is after all of David's mistakes. You see what God is telling David? Isn't that interesting? David messed up and there were consequences, but that's not what defines David. You see, God sees the end product. So guys, again, the same thing. How does God see you? He doesn't see you through your failures. He sees you through your strengths. That's exactly what he's done with David. This is at the end of his life. Look, the God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men righteously, who rules in the fear of God, he didn't say except when you messed up that time, is as the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds when the tender grass springs out of the earth through sunshine after rain. And David responds, truly is not my house so with God. For he has made an everlasting covenant with me. He's done the same for you if you're a believer in Jesus. Ordered in all things and secured for all my salvation and all my desire. Will he not indeed make it grow? You know, 
In Psalm 51, David said, return unto me the joy of my salvation. He didn't say return unto me my salvation. He was eternally saved at that point, just like he said there. But he said, return unto me the joy. You know, and perhaps one of the things that maybe we're missing is living in the joy of our salvation. No matter what happens, we have eternal life. I was telling my dad the other day, and he'll be listening to this shortly, that he can't lose. His health is failing. I pray he has another 10 years, but he can't lose. You're the same way. You cannot lose. You may suffer. You may not like certain circumstances or how things change or this or that, but you're going to win, period, because of Jesus Christ, because of what he did. Because Jesus wins, we win. We studied the book of Revelation. You know how it ends. You've already forgotten. Nope. <laughs> In the end, Jesus wins. And because he wins, we win. Just by belief and just by faith. You know, it reminded me about 400 years prior to David's death, Moses wasn't allowed to enter the promised land, but Joshua was going to lead him there, and Moses made a last speech of his last words. And I want to read you this verse. This is where this verse applies. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. And that verse also applies to you. It's absolutely true for you also. He is always with you. He will never forsake you. And in the end, he will not fail you. You may die, but you won. So Moses gives that instruction. He gives instructions to Joshua. And then Joshua gives instructions to people. And God gives Joshua instructions specifically. And again, you know what the most repeated command in the Bible is? You've heard me say it before. Fear not. Do not fear. Do not fear. Why can we not fear? Something bad may happen. Jesus said in this life you will have troubles, but we can fear not because even the troubles, God's going to work them for good if we love them and are called according to his purpose. Paul said to live is gain. No. To live is Christ. We don't want to get that backwards. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Now turn all the way back to 2 Timothy You know, the heart of this, uh, basically the points and all the thoughts that go with this message were given to me when I was in the waiting room and my youngest daughter was getting her wisdom teeth taken out. Um, I'd been studying the scriptures all week on this and then all of a sudden it just started coming in. And uh, in 30 minutes I had basically the whole message laid out. Now, in 2 Timothy, Paul is speaking some of his last words, and he's telling it to a young preacher, and I'm just going to point out one verse, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power and love and discipline. You see, maybe trying to wrap all this up, obviously there's the beware there's a warning, right, of consequences, of, when, of complacency, and, and then ended up maybe in a, a situation of sin. That's a warning. Beware. Don't do it. But there's more application to these scriptures than that. And it goes back to the mighty men. Why were they mighty? They were gifted. They were brave. And they were faithful. You see, we are also in a war. If you don't think we are, you're being deceived. We are in a spiritual war. Now, the weapons of our warfare are not swords and shields and arrows. It's the word of God. It's prayer. It's love. That's the weapons of our warfare. See, God has called us, in verse 7, he said, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, a spirit of fear, but of power and love and discipline. We have the Holy Spirit. 
residing in us. And you know, when the Holy Spirit came into you and sealed you and resided in you, he gifted you. Do you know that? That's a promise of the scripture. He gifted you. He didn't gift you that to hold on to it and be quiet about it. He gifted however he made you in a unique way. He gifted you to use it for the kingdom, just like these men did. They were gifted physically as warriors to establish the kingdom of God. We are gifted also to establish the kingdom of heaven, the spiritual kingdom. Now, Christ, remember the throne of David? Christ is going to come back and sit on the throne of David, David and establish it physically too, but right now we're building a spiritual kingdom. That is our purpose. You are gifted Mighty warriors. To be honest, sometimes I look more like a mighty wimp. You would probably agree, maybe not. We are to be mighty warriors for Christ Jesus, and we are gifted to carry out the work. Jesus said, it is better for me to go because I'll send you the helper. It's better for you to go. And better is the least in the kingdom of heaven than the greatest beforehand, John the Baptist. So we're more powerful. We have more opportunity because of the Spirit of God to carry out the work and establish the kingdom than John the Baptist had. The least of us, the mightiest wimp here, has more capability than John the Baptist. Be strong, courageous, faithful. We are to be mighty warriors for God. And looking at these men again, They were gifted. You're gifted. Jesus says, in this life you will have troubles, but do not fear. Go into Matthew chapter 24. Jesus said, bad things are going to happen. Wars, famines, disease, all of those things. Earthquakes, storms are going to happen, but do not fear. These things must take place. Over and over. Do not let fear be your master. You will not carry out the will of God if the If the fear is your master, the only true fear that is right is the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom. They were also faithful and loyal to their king. Now, who is our king? King Jesus. The type of loyalty that they would, just so he could have a drink of water, a cool drink of water. Remember the stories in the New Testament too and how that fits so beautifully and then him at the, the well of, in Samar- with a Samaritan woman and Jesus, a well of water springing up to eternal life and then here you have these men that are willing to bust through to get this water on a craving of their king, to risk their lives for the will of their king. There are people trapped behind enemy lines and they can't get the water. How do we bust through? Not with swords and shields, it's the word, prayer, and love, our example. See, what you do matters. Because we are called to be mighty warriors for God. And what you do matters in your neighborhoods, in your homes with your family, in our town, and our nation, missionaries all over the world. It matters. Don't start wandering around on rooftops wondering what this is all about. Don't believe the lies. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, thank you so much for the Holy Spirit. God, thank you for the Holy Spirit that empowers us. And God, help us overcome fear and be like these mighty men that stood. They understood they were in a war and everybody else ran and they stood there because it was the will of God and you delivered them a great victory. God, I think of families and communities out there that They need victory so bad. They need a drink of water, of the living water. God, help us. Show us. Help us. Break through enemy lines and deliver that water. God, forgive us when we haven't been faithful or to carry out the will of God. And as these men were so faithful, 
to carry out David's will, may our will, may we be as faithful also to carry out the will of the Lord Jesus. God, thank you so much for Jesus. He certainly didn't waver in his faithfulness and sacrifice for us. A response is demanded. Thank you so much for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Please rise.